waiting. It's hard, isn't it? Kids have been waiting all week for tomorrow morning. They're going to beg their parents tonight. At least my kids are going to ask me, can we open just one gift? We're tired of waiting. Parents are waiting, really praying that Amazon will bring just one more gift tonight in time. So I don't have to give my kid a picture of the thing that I got them. <laughs> if you got kids in the room, we love it. If they get squirrely, don't even worry about it. It's so fun to be together as a family. But we know what it is to be waiting for things. We wait for test results. We wait for family members to be reconciled. We wait for good news. We wait for a, a second callback for a job offer. We're waiting to be married. We're waiting to have kids. We're waiting for retirement. The Christmas story comes to us in a season of waiting. The world was waiting for its promised rescuer. Israel had been waiting for God to do what he promised he would do in sending a Messiah, his anointed one. The Greek word for that is Christ, that would come and redeem the world and save the world from its sin and restore us back to himself. It had been hundreds of years since Israel had received a prophet, a word from the Lord, and yet they sat waiting. The part of the story that we're looking at tonight is with the shepherds. The shepherds are outside of Bethlehem waiting on their sheep. Do you know what shepherds do at night? They watch their sheep sleep. That's it. The, the hard work is in the day when they watch out for prey and they lead their sheep to water and let them graze and feed. But at night, the, the sheep are put away. And the shepherds have gathered around the fire pits probably. And you know what they're talking about? mandates they're talking about like can you believe it this guy caesar augustus mandates that we leave our hometowns and we travel to the place of our birth and we've had to shut our businesses and we've had to leave those areas and come here because he wants to count all the people why does caesar want to count everybody selfish purposes to figure out how to bolster this tax base how to strengthen his military, and so he's going to count everyone. And in the middle of this conversation that you can imagine that they're having, they're not asleep, they don't see a vision, an angel appears to them. An angel appears in their reality, in their real world lived. And the first thing the angel says, which is good, is do not be afraid. If you see an angel, a messenger of God, they are, they are powerful creatures, their messengers, their authority, they can be intimidating. And so it's good if one shows up in your world to tell you, don't freak out. Just imagine that for a second. Think of the most authoritative person in your life. Perhaps it's your boss who gets to determine your employment. Perhaps it's the owner of the company. Maybe it's your financial advisor or the one who loans you money. If you're a kid, the most authoritative person in your life is probably your mom. Or imagine going home tonight and just the local law enforcement turns on its lights and is pursuing you. Or your boss calls you on Christmas Eve and says, I need to talk to you tonight. Or your mom pulls you into the room and says, we need to have a chat. And your heart's thinking, what are they going to say? I'm in so much trouble. Did they find the warrant that was out for my arrest? And then they say, oh, don't be afraid. What I bring you is good news of great joy for all the peoples. I have good news of great joy for you. So that's, that's the part of the story we want to look at. This is Luke chapter 2, verse 10. I bring you good news, good tidings of great joy. That will be for all the peoples. You know, in a world that we experience, is a similar world of this first century Christians, starving for good news. I'd love to hear some good news tonight. I'd love to share with you good news. If you turn on your news, if you follow anyone on Twitter, I'm telling you, all they do is post bad news. We should just call them the bad news networks. And occasionally, they'll drop in some good news. But in the middle of this night, this angel, a messenger from God, comes to the people and says, I have good news to share with you. Don't be afraid. 
God is drawing near. What is this good news, they say? Well, look at verse 12. This good news, or sorry, verse 11, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The good news is the promised rescuer, the redeemer, restorer, forgiver, the one you've been waiting for is just down the street in Bethlehem. The one that the scriptures promised would be born in Bethlehem. The one that the scriptures promised would come from the family of David. The one the scriptures promised would come is right over there in Bethlehem. For unto you, this Christ, Messiah, has been born. Now, Israel has been longing, waiting for this rescuer, the God's promised Savior. And here he is. The hero of the story is on the scene. Now, why tell shepherds that? I mean, if you're going to let the world know this good news, go find the most prestigious person in town who has a good marketing campaign and let everybody know. I mean, shepherds, they're like blue-collar, sort of marginalized, outcast workers in the community. No one lets shepherds hang out with them. They smell. They're hanging out with sheep all day. They're unclean. They're not welcome at church services. Why tell them? It's because... In Israel's story, the leadership of Israel was referred to as the shepherds of Israel. Remember when God called Abraham, he was a shepherd. When God called Moses, he was shepherding his flocks in Midian. When God called David, he called him out of the fields as a shepherd to come be a king. And the shepherd became this motif of the leadership of Israel, how the leaders would care for the people of God. They would protect the people and provide for the people. They would know the people by name. They would be like a flock that's out in the daytime and brought in at night. The problem was Israel's leaders were bad shepherds. Many of them were terrible shepherds that God brought judgment on the people because of its poor leadership. The poor leadership corrupted the people, abused the people, hurt the people. And so the prophets spoke against Israel's leadership. Can you imagine leadership that's corrupt? It's hard to imagine. Here's a prophet, Ezekiel, in the middle of exile. God tells Ezekiel to say this against Israel's leadership. Chapter 34, verse 2, says, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, ah, shepherds of Israel. That almost sounds like a swear word. Ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? That's what you're there for. You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. You forgot what it means to be a shepherd and love and care and lead for the people of God. And so what God promises is that he will come, the Messiah will come, and he will shepherd his people. Look at 34, verse 11. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep, and I will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so I will seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on the day of the clouds of thick darkness. Check out verse 15. I myself will be a shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed. And I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat of the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. Verse 22, I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant, from the household of David. And he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. Looking for the Messiah, waiting for the promised Messiah, was waiting 
not only for the Savior, but the one who would come into their life and lead them as a shepherd should. As one who finds the weak sheep and gives them strength to come to the sheep that are wounded and hurt and repair them. Those who are in need and provide for them. Those who are threatened by prey and protect them. What the world was waiting for was its shepherd, its good shepherd. Jesus, by his own confession, John 10, 10, says the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. But I have come that they would have life and have abundant life. I'm the good shepherd who lays his life down for his sheep. Jesus came born so that he would die for his sheep. And so here are these angels in Luke chapter 2 saying to shepherds, the promised shepherd who will save you and lead you and care for you and rule you with justice and rightness has arrived. He's down the street in Bethlehem. And this will be a sign for you that you will find this babe wrapped in swaddling cloth, laying in a manger. You know what a manger is? It's just a feeding trough of animals. Now, this is the good news, that the Savior of the world who will forgive our sins, Jesus, who will save his people from their sins, God himself, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, has arrived. But why is that a cause for joy? Maybe a way to ask it is this. What turns good news into great joy? If someone gives good news, what takes that and causes joy in your heart? It's simply this. When you find out that good news is for you. I have four kids, some grandparents from out of town, and they'll send Christmas gifts early. And it's always fun to see a big box arrive with grandma and grandpa's name on it. And then we open it, and with great joy in the family, we put them under the tree because it has their name on it. It's good news. Grandma and grandpa sent gifts. It's great joy when it says my name on it. You know, you see what I'm saying? There's good news out there for some people, but not for me. But who's this good news for in the story? I have good news of great joy for who? All the people. All the people. Usually when someone shares good news today, it's for a select demographic. Good news for 65 and older. Good news for those who are under 30. Good news for those who are having kids. Good news for those who are fill in the blank. But here, this good news is not restricted to a demographic. It's not to a certain people group. This good news doesn't stay with Israel. This good news doesn't, isn't just for men or for women or for young or for old or for healthy or for those who are put together or for those who are pretty. It's the good news that can cause great joy for all the people. Why? Because this good news gift has your name on it. It's personalized to every person in this room. There's a gift of God that has your name on it. And inside this gift is the saving shepherd that was promised through the scriptures. That if you're feeling weak and bruised and broken, he's the one that comes and gives strength, healing, and repair. That's why it's so exciting to gather in this room, remember Christmas, because Christmas is God's gift to you. It's not to them, it's to you. Every person in this room can receive the gift of Christmas, God's presence with us to forgive us, to restore us, and to bring us back in right relationship with God and with others and with self. But where do I get that? Well, it's at the end here. Is that you're going to go find him in this manger in humility. See, he doesn't come all prestigious, riding on white horses. That's not approachable. That, that, that remains far from us. He comes as a babe, as a baby. How approachable is a baby? It's like, just get that thing in my arms. Let me cuddle with it. Let me love on it. That's called Christ's humiliation. That God in his 
divine grace does not come to us as the superior, incredible, accomplished leader. But as God himself, he humbles himself to come, born of a virgin, laying on straw in a feeding trough. I love that the sign is you're going to find him in a feeding trough. It doesn't say, you're going to find this baby, the most beautiful baby you've ever seen, wrapped in pottery barn swaddling clothes, lying in a restoration hardware crib, embroidered name on everything. You'll know it's him. Now you're going to find this baby in humility so that the vilest and weakest and broken of us in this room can approach him. That's how Christ comes to us. That's the kindness of God. And then the angel is joined by a company of angels. You see this? It was one angel, and all of a sudden there's a multitude, thousands upon thousands of heavenly hosts, and they're all screaming one thing. Glory to God in the highest. God gets the glory for this. We're not saving ourselves. We didn't ask him to come. We're like enemies of God. So before we even asked him to come into our life, he came into our life. So God gets the glory. He's the hero of the story. Glory to God from the lowest parts of the earth to the highest heaven. It's all about God. That's how we want to live our life. If God has somehow been been misplaced in your life to be anything lower than that, you just elevate him back. Glory to God in the highest. And then this last refrain, they say, and peace among men or women, amongst people with whom he's pleased. Now, this word peace is a beautiful biblical word. It's connected to the word shalom in Hebrew. Peace is more than just simply the absence of conflict, but it's the presence of wholeness. To have peace in your life doesn't mean that there's just no conflict. It's that what is broken and bruised is repaired. Relationships that are fractured are brought back together. When someone experiences the peace of God, they're experiencing the wholeness of what it means to truly be human. In the Gospel of Luke, who's recording these eyewitness accounts of Jesus' healings, he picks up on this piece. And when there are these people who come to him with great sins that the the community has kicked out of their community or come with diseases that have limited them to participating with families and gatherings and festivities, Jesus touches them, Jesus forgives them. And then do you know what Luke records that Jesus says to them? Go in peace. Why does he say that? Because if your sins are forgiven and he's healing you and he's bringing you back into community, that's the essence of peace. There's no more conflict with you and God. He's restoring conflict with one another and he's bringing peace even within ourselves. Who would like to experience that kind of peace this Christmas? Who wants to experience that kind of peace in our world that comes through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone? So it says he has peace like that with those whom he's pleased. Now, what does that mean? Like, wait, I thought it was good news and great joy for all the people and peace for those whom he's pleased. What is that? What pleases God? What pleases him? Do you know? Is it just you coming to him? That's what pleases him. There's this beautiful story of children who are annoying all these adults while they're trying to listen to Jesus. And then Jesus is like, knock it off. Let them come to me. It pleases me when my children, no matter how broken, bruised, vile they are, just come to me. And all those who come to him receive the peace of God, the forgiveness through Christ, and life everlasting. So here's the news. It's good God is here to forgive us. Great joy. That's for you. Your name is written on the gift. The question is, are you going to open it? Of all the things to wait for, you don't have to wait to receive Jesus. You don't have to wait for him. He has arrived in our life, and he's ready to join you in yours as soon as you ask him to. Another gospel writer by the name of John, who's another eyewitness account, he draws all of this same story in this other motif of light and darkness. 
Darkness is our estate without God, living in darkness. And he says, and there was a, behold, a great light, which is Christ, the light of life who penetrates the darkness. And those who love their sin saw this light coming, John says, and just retreated back into darkness because they hate the light, lest their deeds be exposed. But those who saw the light and said, that's the good shepherd, my savior, who binds up the brokenhearted, who's cl close to those who are crushed in spirit, who brings life into death and restores all things. I'm coming to the light. And so we do our candlelight on Christmas Eve to remember our estate in darkness, in waiting for the Savior to come. And then behold, a light comes, penetrating the darkness and then is received and spread from one person to the next, that the good news, it's called the gospel, goes throughout all of the world. So if you have your candles, grab those, and we're gonna move into a time of darkness. Turn off all the lights, and just remember where we are apart from Christ. We'll have a few people come up and, and get light off of this candle, and then they're going to share it with you. you know, it's like sharing the gospel with you. So I want you to sit in darkness for a moment, and then we'll light our candles. One ask is that you would tip an unlit candle to a lit candle. It saves us from cleaning a lot of wax. But let's pray for a moment. Father God, I thank you that in your kindness, goodness, and mercy, you saw wandering sheep, lost sheep, like me and like us, who were in need of a shepherd, and that you would send the Son of God, God himself, to be with us, to lay his life down for us, and so, Father, I pray that we would all receive and reflect on the good news that has our name on it, that causes us to have great joy 